This is Alexandra Constantine, and you are listening to the Dicinius Review, where we discuss novels, film, art, and culture from a perspective outside the mainstream. The Review is a Substack podcast, but you can listen to us on Spotify, YouTube, Apple, and anywhere else via RSS. If you enjoy the show, please like, follow, and share this episode. Hey listeners, welcome to the show. I'm recording this on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Spring is fully present in my part of South Carolina, and the weather is perfect. A part of me wanted to reschedule today's episode and spend the afternoon reading in my backyard, but this is a good one, and one I've been looking forward to doing for a while. Two years ago, in the spring of 2022, I found myself in the South Pacific. More accurately, a small island off the coast of Papua New Guinea, somewhere in the middle of the Bismarck Sea. It was around this time that I got an email from my friend, editor, and writing mentor, and of course the founder of the Palin Press. He sent me an early digital copy of the first novel to be published by Pylon Press, Shagdick, by J.B. Jackson. Now, for you guys not to know, Pylon Press is a new independent publisher and home of Schaller Herrnström, the best author of contemporary sword and sorcery out there, and that takes a bit of a different approach than a lot of others in the small press and independent space. Pylon is focused on quality over quantity, prioritizing a heavy editorial involvement and a de- developmental growth of its writers. This means that the output is much slower than the usual independent publisher, but this is their method, and after now reading several of the books they have put out, I've become a convert myself. But of course, whenever I get sent a new novel to read and give my opinion on it, I get a bit of a knot in my stomach. Just because it's well written doesn't mean I'll like it, especially indie novels. I just, I'm just i just sick of the same sort of thing getting published, Conan Pastiche, Game of Thrones wannabes, or endless space opera crap I have no interest in. So on a tropical Sunday morning, hungover from a long night of drinking with the locals, I stumbled my ass to the veranda overlooking the sea, ordered a long black espresso, and started Shagduck. I couldn't put it down. I spent the entire day reading J.B. Jackson's debut novel, drank espresso after espresso, and chain-smoked through a pack of cigarettes until I finally finished the book. Shagduck was one of my favorite reads from 2022, and that year was one where I read some great novels for the first time, like Moby Dick, Inherent Vice, and No Country for Old Men. J.B. Jackson's Shagduck is a character-driven epistolary, epistolary? Well, fuck, I never said it right. Epistolary novel. We are reading the daily journals of our main character, Steve, a 20-something college librarian in 1977 Fort Worth, Texas. The main plot thread, but in my, my opinion, not the point of the novel, is that the eccentric Professor Sherwood, who happened to be one of the one who gave Steve the journal, disappears, and Steve and his co-worker, Randy, try to figure out what happened to him. The wonderful part of Shagdick is that Jackson takes the journal format seriously, and we get daily entries that feel real because of the mundane nature of Steve's life. We get commentary about television shows, music, restaurants, concerts, music from meetings at work, observations about his co-workers and his feelings for, for the women in his life, like his upstairs neighbor and her cat. Oh, and of course, the slithering demonic presence unintentionally unleashed into the world. The beauty of this novel is that the reader almost knows more than the main character because we are expecting the supernatural, while Steve is squarely in the mundane world. Shagduk is one of those masterfully crafted novels where you can go back to the beginning after your first read and see the obvious clues that both Steve and you as the reader missed. Like I said above, Shagduk was one of my favorite novels of 2022 and hands down the best novel I've ever read from a small independent publisher. But I'll add a caveat, it's not for everyone. Shagduk is a character-driven work, one that is as much about 1977 Fort Worth than it is about occult demons. It's a novel about young adults navigating a strange world of friendships and relationships. It's a fantastic example of independent fiction that breaks through the genre. It is fantasy, not really. Urban fantasy, too good. Is it literary fiction? Somewhat. Occult mystery? Sometime. Ultimately, it's Shagduk, and I fucking love it. So today, I am happy to have on the show J.B. Jackson himself. Not only do I have J.B. Jackson, but I have a crisp copy of his upcoming novel, Ursula of Ulm, the direct sequel to Shagdick. I'm not going to focus too much on the sequel today because it's not out yet and I don't want to spoil it, but it's wonderful and I plan on doing a review show very soon. Jackson, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Alex. Uh, I've been looking forward to this too. Um, I really appreciate you having me on here. Absolutely. You know, I think... um, when I first started the podcast, I made a list of must have people that I wanted to get in the first few months and you were at the top of the list. Um, and that's because I loved Shagduck. Shagduck was 
no shit, one of my favorite novels I read in the last few years. And uh, I actually just did a reread of it last week because I wanted to, you know, catch up on and reacquaint myself with some of the characters before I started Ur Ur Ursula of Ulm. So let's talk about Shagduck, man. Let's talk about Shagduck and Ursula. Where did this novel come from and where's it going? And of course, I'm sure there's, you know, this is something you've been asked a million times on different interviews. Why did you decide to do the, the journal format? Um, okay, these are good questions. Um, first, I want to say I'm pleased to hear that you chain smoked while reading Shagduk. There's something very right about that. Um, I had to. I had to. In, in part because all the characters are chain smoking. Um, the uh, book takes place in 1977 when everyone is smoking. Um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, it's it's not for everyone. It wasn't written for everyone either. It was um, kind of really written for myself and for a couple of friends and for people who get where I'm coming from. And I figured there that, that some people would get where I was coming from. Um, I always thought that if one person likes something, someone else will too. Like nobody's, um, you know, unique that way. Absolutely. So part of the challenge is getting Shagduk into the hands of the right people. Uh, right. That's proven probably um, to be the biggest challenge of all, um, apart from writing it. Um, you asked, <clears throat> why did I choose a diary format? Um, well, I have a, a good reason for it. Let's see if I can articulate it. Um, I do have a little bit of formal training in uh, writing. Um, and I always figured uh, I had, um, some creative stuff in me and I always tried to figure out what, what the best way to get that out was. So I've, I've been in, in bands, uh, I was in bands for 10 years, uh, and that informs, um, some of what, um, go, went into Shag Duck, uh, cause Steven's also in a band. That's apparent. That's yeah. very apparent from reading the book. And, uh, you know, the, I had some stories to tell and I figured I could, I could do that through Steven. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I, sh I struggled with starting, um, stories and novels and whenever I would try and write, it would come out as like you said earlier, you know, either a Conan pastiche or, um, a cheap imitation of the, of the writers that I admired. Um, I didn't know what my voice was, um, I didn't know what story I wanted to tell. I wasn't close to my characters. It didn't mean anything to me. And if it doesn't mean anything to me, it, it's impossible for it to mean anything to uh, the reader. So I, I always abandon these false starts. So um, I came across a book, and this is just purely by chance. I, I don't know, maybe I do remember how did I come across this? I came across the book um, Diary of a Nobody by George and his brother Whedon, uh, W-H-E-E-D-O-N. How about, how about that for a name? Uh, George and Whedon Grossmith. Um, they were around, you know, probably a hundred years ago. Um, they wrote a comic novel called Diary of a Nobody, and it was written in a diary format. And... I loved it. I laughed my ass off. And about the same time, I read another novel written in a diary format called um, Satan Wants Me by Robert Irwin. Um, I had some years before encountering these two books done, um, been involved in the world of zines. Um, as you may recall, in the 90s, it was possible to create a um, little magazine about whatever you wanted. My friends did it in college, and uh, so I did it too. And it was kind of just to entertain each other. Right. Uh, but it also gave me experience in um, you know, typesetting, bid design. Um, I was in con complete control of every aspect of the zine. Uh, and I liked that. I really enjoyed the process of not just the content, but the um, the nuts and bolts of putting the thing together. <clears throat> right, the full creation of it, the full um, the full total product, the full total package of it. Right. Yeah, 
So I would hand this thing out to friends and relatives and, you know, some of them would be baffled, but a couple of them loved it. They thought this is hilarious. We want more. So I'd write more. Uh, and and the, char uh, the character was myself, but I was posing as um, a really extreme, absurd version of myself. And that was a character who was um, kind of a dandy, um, overly civilized, uh, who finds himself living in a... Um, kind of a terrible neighborhood in San Francisco where there's a lot of crime and, and danger and noise. And he was constantly beset by um, ugliness and crassness. And so he had like these ridiculous um, observations of the stuff happening. And it, it kind of read like a, like a cheap imitation of Diary of a Nobody. Um, but it's where I got um, my practice for organizing my thoughts in such a way that lent itself to a daily journal. Okay. So back to Robert Irwin and the, the Grossmiths, um, they showed me that a, a novel could be written in a, in a diary format. And uh, it kind of, um, I suddenly realized, well, maybe this is how I could write my novel. Um, I know how to do that. Whereas, um, a conventional narrative that, you know, mo the way most novels are written. Um, I struggled with that a lot. So I thought, okay, I can, I can do this. Um, so what do I write about? And I struggled with that again, had a lot of false starts, but then um, it occurred to me, uh, it'd be fun if I said it in 1970 in the seventies, because that was a time that I'm close to and I'm really interested in. Uh, mo most of the things that I love are from that time period. Um, I kind of live in that time period in my mind. So I thought, well, that'd be a fun way to revisit the 70s as, as an adult. And um, so that, that was easy. Uh, it, that suddenly made it a lot more interesting to me because it presented the challenge of um, – writing in such a way that was truthful to the time and did not contain um, anachronistic details. So um, right. that and, involved and a, quick, a lot of quick aside, quick aside, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I remember specifically when I was reading Shagdik for the first time, there was, I believe uh, there's a football game or they're watching a football game some, somewhere in the novel. And yep. I actually stopped reading it and I ran to my room because that's the only place I had internet at that time and I looked up the year and the football teams that were playing because I wanted to see if you were on point I was like let me test this motherfucker out you know let's see if he's got it and you did I was like wow okay this guy is a serious dude when it comes to the details in this novel you know so another challenge was you you want to have um, details like that, that bring the period to life, but they can't be um, gratuitous. Um, that's, you get that sometimes with people who are trying too hard to um, uh, here. Here's an example, um, a movie set in 1980 and you're watching the movie and every single car is from 1980. Right. That's that's not how the world works. And in, in 1980, everyone was driving cars that were new, of course, but also 5, 10, 20 years old. Right. And you'd see a mix of these. It's a natural. So you wanted to be conscious of, of making that kind of mistake where it would uh, snap the reader out of it and, and say, oh, you know, haha, I get it. He's he's trying too hard here. Um, but back to the research part of it, um, I'm a librarian. And I love doing research. And so that made it a lot of fun for me. So here I was writing in a format that I understood. Um, it was fun for me. I'm writing about things that I knew about and cared about. And I began to realize that um, the more I cared about what I was writing, the more other people would probably care about it. Um, I think I meant to go back and, and talk about a couple of other things. And I've <laughs> well, that's okay. We've got some time. Actually, like everything you've said so far has um, proven the value of why I wanted you on here because, you know, 
the whole point of this, you know, the whole point of this interview and the whole point of this podcast is to have conversation about books that I love and I think other people should read. And also the act of writing itself, the art of writing. And you started off by mentioning something that I think is fantastic and that I live by myself is that you should write for yourself. Too often, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, too often in like um, writers groups or uh, you know, you look in online writers groups, which are I find completely fucking useless, right? But you look at these writers groups and they're like, oh, you know, you should write for the market, or nobody wants to read that. People are really into like romance or whatever, or they're not into romance, and it's like, shut up, okay? If one person likes what I write, I'm happy. That's all I care about, and because ultimately, it is a personal artistic thing for me. So I like that you said that a lot. And, you know, to hop onto the, the concept of, zi- of zines, I'm familiar with them, but see, I'm a little bit younger than you. Um, I was born in 1983, right? So I'm younger than your character in your, in your novel. And uh, zines weren't really a thing in the 90s when I was growing up. Uh, I think the closest thing would be like the personal live journal blog people had where they talked about their yep. day-to-day stuff. That would probably be the closest thing that we had. Um, we did have like the do-it-yourself punk rock like pamphlets and stuff that we'd get for, about for shows and parties. But the Zion culture was a fascinating one that happened a little bit before me. But I do know enough about it to understand what you're talking about. And I think most of my readers also do. Um, And, you know, you said something like really, really great just now about like, you know, the whole do it yourself, the whole, you know, independent thing. And I think, you know, in the nineties and eighties, we just didn't have the tools available to us to do a novel by ourselves because we lacked, you know, the internet, we lacked the, easy publishing formats but now with all the technology at our fingertips we have the ability to really take back and do it you know do the zion thing but with novels and that's what i think is so fantastic about the independent writing scene not always great but the seeds are there like the early you know beginning and like the energy almost feels like the punk rock energy of the 90s and the 80s and uh you know the whole era what do you think about that yeah, um, I'm pretty excited about what's happening in indie publishing right now. But like you, um, I don't care to really read any of it. It doesn't. Uh, it's not my cup of tea. But that's not to um, denigrate it or dismiss it at all. I think there's an energy there that's that's really good for our culture and it's good for civilization. And I hope it gains some steam. Um, especially in light of what's happened to, um, um, I think people are calling it traditional publishing, trad publishing. Right. Um, the major publishers are cranking out stuff that um, uh, there's definitely an audience for it. I mean, it, it still sells. There's still a demand for it. People um, are on long waiting lists for new novels uh, at the library. And, you know, it's good that there's something for everyone out there. Um, I would never say that, um, um, you know, what I'm doing is is the one way or the right way or even necessarily a good way, uh, but it's proven to be good in that I have found you and I found some other people who understood what I'm doing Um and they were entertained by it, and I, I get a lot of fulfillment from that. Just thinking that there's a you know handful of other people who who really enjoyed um, something I created and put so much work into. Um, that's all the validation I need. Right, um, I would not want to be famous for sure. Uh, right, that's all that matters. Right, is like somebody yeah. gets it. Somebody out there in the in the vast universe gets it. All right, I'm going to move on to another question, man. So. 1977 Fort Worth, all right? That is a character in its own right in the novel, okay? The place. It seems to be a place that is very formative in your own life. Um, What about it stayed with you? Okay, listen, so like a lot of writers have a place that they write about even after they no longer live there, a sort of a regional flavor, you know. um, Myself, I recently moved to South Carolina, but after almost two years, I'm 
still working on a novel set in Southern California where I grew up, okay? In a way, I'm trying to exercise it so I can move on to a different, you know, locale. Um, but what is it about Fort Worth to your life? Because you obviously know the place. I mean, reading reading Shagduck and Ursula, I can't tell the difference between real and fiction because it feels like a real place. And I've never been to Fort Worth. I've been through Texas, but I've never been to Fort Worth. And um, it feels so lived in, so real, so, so you know, accurate uh, from an outsider perspective reading. What, what is it about Fort Worth that made you set, make it a setting? Well, I was born there and I grew up there and I love the place. I just love it. Um, I don't want to go back and live there because it's too damn hot. Uh, I, I, I have a home here in Northern California and I love it here too. But um, have you ever watched a movie that was set in a place that you knew and you're looking at it and you're not even paying attention to the movie because you're looking past the characters at the street they're on and thinking, I know that street or, Hey, look, it's that fountain that I know. Um, well, I grew up in Los Angeles, so almost 50% of movies <laughs> are from where I grew up. Well, once upon a time, uh, everything was, was filmed in and around L.A., um, even though they would say, you know, MASH, they said, was supposed to be Korea, but it was clearly the um, San Fernando Valley. Mm. Um, no, uh, a, a good example of this, that um, the movie, um, what's the name of that movie? Slacker took place in Austin in the nineties. Uh, that's when I went to um, college there and slackers filmed all over Austin. So when you're watching it, um, you see places you've been to streets that, you know, you know, front, your friend's house is back there. It's a lot of fun to watch, you know, just for that reason. So I was thinking, um, well, I know Fort Worth, so I want to write about it, but, um, there aren't any movies or books that take place in Fort Worth. I mean, there are, um, there's a handful, um, Logan's run. Uh, uh, one of the scenes in Logan's run was filmed at the, the water gardens, downtown Fort Worth. Um, there, um, you know, there's an old Jimmy Stewart war movie filmed in Fort Worth, but you know, Fort Worth is not, um, a place that people know about, um, a lot of people don't even know where Fort Worth is. You have to tell them it's near Dallas. No one talks about Fort Worth. Um, as a quick aside, I'll just say that Fort Worth is suddenly being discovered. Um, who's that guy who did? Um, he's making all those TV series that take place back in you know the olden days. Oh, the um, that Wild West thing. Um, yeah, um, the name escapes me. Some of them, some of them have names that are just like a year, like eighteen seventy three. Yeah, I've ne I've never seen it, but it's like the kind of like conservative tinged one, right? I think um, it's got a that famous guy in it. <laughs> I don't watch a lot of TV, so I'm not yeah, sure. yeah. Well, I actually watch all of it, and now I can't even remember a thing about it. But <laughs> I'm told um, by people who know that Fort Worth is suddenly. Um, on the map uh it's it's a hip place famous people are buying houses there and, and whatnot so that's kind of weird that that's happening right now um have you been so anyway, back, have back you been to, back to fort worth since uh, you moved away yeah i go back from time to time and while i'm there i kind of make mental notes of things that you know hey i could put that in my book um different changes and everything so it, it excites me that um, my book is in Fort Worth because I love um, being truthful to um, what that place is about and the geography. Um, you know, again, when, when a place is supposed to be filmed somewhere, let's see, um, a lot of those Hallmark movies take place in quaint towns, but they're all filmed in Vancouver. And you can tell it's like that's not Maryland. That's clearly Vancouver. That's you know Grouse Mountain or whatever. Everything's in Vancouver nowadays. I think. Yeah. So, um, what is it? Better Call Saul was uh, filmed in Albuquerque. That was so cool to me because Albu no one talks about Albuquerque and because it sucks. And, and so you're watching the TV <laughs> show, but then it, you're I'm like looking down the streets and go, oh, wow, look at Albuquerque. Um, so that's what it looks like. 
Yeah, I think Breaking Bad did for Albuquerque what Fargo did for Fargo and um, Shaq yeah, yeah. was doing for Fort Worth for me, you know? So because I love Fort Worth and I miss it, um, my book was kind of a, a love letter to Fort Worth too. Um, I knew that people who like fantasy and who know Fort Worth, I think they'll be excited to read this book because they'll read it and say, hey, I, you know, I know that place. I know that street. Or, or what what Jackson's saying about this rings true because I've experienced it too. Right. And you know, that that really, you succeeded because me as a non-Fort Worth visitor, uh, that really came through. Like the, like the spirit of Fort Worth, at least from the perspective of your characters and obviously of you, um, really came through. Now, um, did you actually drive a Rambler when you were younger or where, where's the Rambler come from? Well, um, Oh, a lot of what went into my book has a um, is rooted in a grain of truth. Um, it's best to write what you know about because you can write about it truthfully. So uh, the idea for the Rambler, um, you know, I wanted Stephen to have a certain kind of car, and I, and I, I thought of a whole bunch of different ones. The one that felt right was was the Rambler. I can't tell you why I chose it, but when um before i had a car before i even had a driver's license um, a neighbor had a rambler for sale and um it was real cheap and i thought it was cool and old and i begged my parents you know to buy this car for me but um instead of a stick shift it had push buttons if you hmm. wanted to shift into second gear you pushed like the second gear button and there was no button for a reverse and my dad goes, how are you going to back up? Um, it didn't occur to me to get, get it repaired. Like, I'm, I'm sure you could have gotten it repaired. But instead, I just said, hey, um, I won't put myself in that position where I need to go backwards. Right. Which you know, is harder <laughs> than it sounds. But it was a ridiculous answer that a 15-year-old would give. But um, that I remembered the, the push buttons and the the – reverse button being missing. I thought oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. You know, I'll give um, Stephen that car. And um, so deciding things like that, like what car does he drive um, names of characters? Um, part of the fun of just writing it in the first place is, is making these decisions because um, sometimes they just feel right. Sometimes you don't, you don't know what to choose and it becomes a burden, but it's still fun trying to come up with the just right, you know, le mot juste, the right word, but you know, the right detail, the right name, the right this, the right that. Um, I get a lot of pleasure um, trying to get it all just right. Right, and that's the fun. Um, that's the fun part about writing. I mean, writing's not just uh, sweating over your laptop the whole time. It's there's some fun, fun elements. Yeah. And there are aspects to writing that are not fun, and sometimes it's be, it's a real chore. And I worry that, um, you know, I lose the desire to do it, and I don't want that to infect what I'm doing. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of love that goes into um, my writing. Right. And, you know, that really comes through. <laughs> Funny enough, when I was young, when I was like 16 and I first started driving, um, somebody offered to sell me a Volkswagen Carmen Ghia, right? And yeah. I love those cars. I love the way they look. But it was it needed a lot of work. The paint was all peeling, you know. And I was like, oh, I can't do it. I can't really afford to fix it. I don't know anything about cars. And I regret it to this day. I also regret the fact that a few years later, Quentin Tarantino puts the Carmen Ghia in Kill Bill 2, like, front and center and I was so bummed out I was like damn it I wanted that car so bad but you know maybe I'll write a Carmen Ghia in one of my novels just like the Rambler well when you um you already were interested in that car but when you saw it in the Tarantino movie it added more meaning to it for you right right um and I recognize that um when I write about something it adds more meaning to the thing that I wrote about uh, and so I'll be out and about, um, and I'll see something and hear something and I'll think, oh, that's in my book. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, what we're, what we're talking about here to, you know, 
take it to like the internet real fast. But we're actually talking about world building, right? We're talking about world building in the, the proper way, which is we're not focusing on elvish languages or any of that stuff, right? Because that's not what interests us. What we're focusing mm-hmm. on is the little details that make it real, that make that's true world building, not the history of, you know, your ancient land or whatever, but I mean, that might make it real for some people, but we'll, you know, the details like the Rambler or this band or this football team playing the Super Bowl this year uh, or this brand, that, that is world building. And I think for all his faults, and he has a few, Quentin Tarantino in his movies does a fantastic job of world building because you, it's a believable world that he creates even though it's his fantasy version of the past like in once upon a time in hollywood for example but he gets the details right he gets those those uh, um you know those those, like the streets like you know he recreated hollywood in 1969 to the point where like people that lived at that time commented wow that takes me back to when i was a kid driving down the street that you got sunset boulevard you know perfect and that's the same thing you did shagdick i think and that's the right way to do world building. I do I do want to jump back to something real quick. We were talking about um, going back, you know, writing about things back in the past and uh, or movies or anything like that. And sometimes people like oversaturating the media with uh, uh, things that we code as like the 80s. Like, you know, like the movie, uh, the, the TV show Stranger Things. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah, I did see it. Um... I think it's I think it's pretty good, but they try real hard to you know make it seem like the '80s, where everybody's playing Dungeons and Dragons and all the posters are like that, and that's just not really authentic. I mean, the the two guys that wrote that show are my age, I think, so they didn't they're not the age of the characters at all. They were never that age in the '80s. They're more they were a lot younger. But it was almost like a pastiche of like what we think as the 80s, like my generation thinks of the 80s. And you see that in a lot of, you know, in a lot of work right now, whether it's like uh, written, written work, like literature or film, um, the 80s and the 90s are like the new obsession. The 90s is the new obsession right now. Um, but when I grew up in the 90s, when I was a, you know, young, I was a middle schooler, high schooler in the 90s, I was not into the 90s, all right? I was into 80s punk rock and 80s goth new wave and that kind of stuff. So if you were to write me into a book, I would be completely out of place because I did not have bleach spiked hair, wear pipes, jeans, and listen to like Limb Biscuit, which is what people in the 90s are associated with. So that's why, you know, you're you're right. Sometimes you cannot just oversaturate a work with like that decade stuff because people aren't that decade they're from before and after and all yeah. sorts of mixes you know um what, what show what show or tv show do you think gets that you know your era that you write about like cor- correct um you ever seen a 70s show is that accurate at all or well you know i was a little kid in the 70s i was born in 68 um the 70s are vivid to me but they're i, I view them through the lens of a of an eight-year-old so um if somebody sets something in a particular time, if they do it with love and they put some effort into it, they'll get much better results. Um, sometimes it, it's not it's not enough to love a time. So there's a, a, a TV show I watched recently called Palm Royale, hmm. and it takes place in 1969. And so um, it's beautiful. It's, um, you know, I enjoyed it. I found it entertaining. But one thing that bugged me is they didn't put much effort into getting the dialogue right. So they said things that only people would say today, but they didn't say it back then. And I won't say it ruined it for me. It didn't, but it bugged me a lot. I just thought it was, you know, they show like a bookcase in one scene and I, you know, I'm a librarian, I'm bookish. So my eyeballs go straight to the spines and I'm looking at the books. And it's like, those books aren't from 69 or before those books are from much later. It would have take, been so easy for them to get that right. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm not the audience. They, they were making that for a different audience and I recognize that and it's fine. Um, I don't reject it for for that reason you know i'm i'm 
there probably weren't very many people looking at the bookcase during that scene. Um, <laughs> I mean, I do. I do all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I'm like, what are they reading? What's going on? Is there a clue in there? You know, what's the, is there a secret code, you know, for the Illuminati, the reptiles that this, you know, program is trying to tell me in uh, the titles of the books on the bookshelf? But that's probably because I'm a schizophrenic or something like that. But, you know, I get your point. But to answer your question, I, I can't. Nothing comes to the mind of a period piece where they where they nailed it. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know if. Oh, that's that's interesting, you know, and that, that's something I always look look into. You know, now that I'm getting older, movies are going to be, you know, they're going to start to set movies in the '90s for sure, and that's really going to uh, wig me out because I'm. That's when I've really reached old age, I guess when. You know, people make uh, retrospectives of people's lives set in the '90s. I'm waiting for the like a Kurt Cobain movie or something like that, and then I'll know that uh, you know things are going. And there's you know there's tons of remakes right now. I just I just recently went and saw the the new Ghostbusters, and uh, that was really an homage to early '80s filmmaking. And it wasn't a great movie at all, to be honest. But it was a movie that was made with like respect and obvious care and love for the original material. So yeah. it, it succeeded in that, in that realm, I think. Um, and I wasn't disappointed by it. Like you, I am by a lot of other remakes or attempts at continuing. All right. So besides the time and place that you, you have in Shag Duck and in your work, the other like massive element that you cannot even ignore in this novel is music. All right. It's obvious from reading the book that you're a musician yourself or you were a musician. Okay. And there's just tons of musical knowledge and details and it's like front and center. And there's, I mean, I played in local bands in my early twenties and I found all the band like rehearsal scenes to be on point. All right. So, uh -huh. Is music a big part of your life, and how does it tie into writing? Do you get influenced by music? Um, I mean, do you listen to music when you write, for example? Music is a huge part of my life. I'm obsessed with it. I listen to it as often as I can, um, particularly in the car. I have a long commute, and so I can listen to, for example, an entire Beethoven symphony. And it's just me and the music. I'm cranking it. I'm listening to it carefully. I'm studying it. And it, you know, it's hard to do that when you're at home and dishes, dirty dishes beckon or the lawn needs to be mowed or the dogs are barking. Right. So um, I make time to listen to music. I think about it a lot. I talk about it a lot. Um, I, I care deeply about music. It, it um, So... I know that I'm not alone in that and that um, people would respond to the way that I write about music. So I wasn't worried about that at all. It's like, okay, here's a built-in audience, people who like music and like seventies music in particular, they're going to, they're going to love all this. Um, right. And for people that are listening to this at home, if you read Shag Duck, the main character, Steven, he is, he joins a band and he plays in a band and he's a musician. He's a bass player. Are you a bass player? I am. Okay. So my, bro my younger brother was the bass player. I played a little bit of bass, but I mostly played guitar, but I did play bass in one band. So I, I liked it, but you know, you're all about, you know, name dropping the, the equipment. Okay. Like the, the Vulcan amps and everything. So that, that, you know, there's a real, attention to detail when it comes to music geekness, you know? Um, and I, and I love that. So, well, you... again, it's, it's not gratuitous. Um, I, I wanted to write um, what a real person would write about. I would write about that stuff in my own diary. So therefore Stephen would too. Right. And you know, one of the things that I think you succeeded very, you know, very much so succeeded in, in Shagduk is that the journal entries they they feel authentic they feel real because you balance the mundane with the fantastical you balance the 
meaninglessness kind of like day-to-day ephemera of like, oh, hey, I'm at a meeting and blah, 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 and this is stupid and so-and-so is kind of cute and she has a stupid cat and blah, blah, and all that stuff with some, you know, plot threads that kind of move the plot forward, but it does ultimately read like a real journal. Like I can look through my journal and it reads very similar to the actual novel. And that's, I think that was was a fantastic work you did with that. Um, Well, thank you. And I, and I have a a comment about that. Um, I wanted, when I first started writing, I wanted to write something terrible and dark, Um, you know, demons and the occult and whatnot. But um, I couldn't help but be funny. And it's like, oh, my, my humor is seeping into my writing and it's spoiling everything. And it bothered me at first um, until I read a, um, a, a remarks about um, the composer uh, Gustav Mahler, who, um, if you listen to one of his symphonies, they're huge and sprawling and there's highs and lows and drama and darkness and light and beauty and ugliness. And I think he, I can't quote him verbatim, but he said something about, um, or maybe a critic said this, um, and I'm paraphrasing in a Mahler symphony, you have everything but the kitchen sink. And I think it was meant in a disparaging way, but, um, I understood that, if you have um, light next lightness next to darkness, um, it it makes both it it, it um, the contrast um, bring brings out their qualities better than if you have uh, them in isolation. Right. I mean that 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 um, that concept <clears throat> applies to many things. I mean, it applies to food, right? That's why we have you know sweet and salty and uh, savory and light mixed together, right? <laughs> So as an example of where they have the mundane next to the the supernatural, um, I suggest the the movie uh, Poltergeist, right. which is set in modern times in a in a ordinary subdivision with ordinary people living ordinary lives, and then when extraordinary things are, are put up against it, uh, it's really extraordinary because you you see the um, the distance between the two is right in front of you. I mean, and that is, to me, that is one of the key elements of a good horror work of art, a good horror novel, because it's not horrible unless you have the good to contrast it with. And the scariest thing, in my opinion, is when you have the mundane and the ordinary, and there's a crack in it, and the crack slowly develops. I think um, Poltergeist, absolutely, that's actually the first movie i've ever watched in english growing up so i have like a i'm fond of that movie i watched the first two (laughs) movies i ever watched were in the same night and they're poltergeist and beetlejuice back to back and (laughs) those are still to this day some of my favorite movies um and i just saw the preview for the new beetlejuice coming out and i'm somewhat optimistic um but you know, David Lynch, I'm a, I'm a big David Lynch fan. I don't know if you like David Lynch, but Twin Peaks is exactly what we're talking about here. It's a middle of nowhere, Washington state town, and it's a bunch of mundane people doing mundane things. And then the weird supernatural comes in, but it's almost like meta because he takes the mundanity of a, like a soap opera. The, the, the show yeah. is almost like written and almost filmed like a cheesy soap opera and then each episode as it goes along weirder and weirder stuff stuff start happening to where you're like oh there's something else going on there's some darkness beneath you know the mundanity of everyday life and uh, beneath the perfection and i think that's the key to true horror or at least the best horror um so yeah man that's awesome a couple of words about Lynch. I am a big Lynch fan. And when you mentioned Twin Peaks, the first thing that pops into my head is um, Kyle uh, McLaugh- McLaughlin sitting at the bar going on about coffee and pie. Right, exactly. Like it's the, the mundane details were the first to leap to mind. Not the weird stuff, but the pie. Right, the donuts. But in his movie, um, Mulholland Drive, um, his bad guys. 
um, are your run-of-the-mill bad guys, but they have like these bosses, and the bosses are sh more shadowy. And the higher up you go, it, you don't even see the boss anymore. You, you he just there's a phone call from the boss, and you're afraid of the guy on the phone. But um, a lot of people, when they think, okay, I'm gonna, I want to write something scary they make up gross monsters and, you know, hideous teeth. And um, one of the scariest guys I can think of was in Mulholland drive. It's the, do you remember the cowboy in the oh, parking yeah. lot? Yeah, absolutely. And the cowboys like, uh, you think this is a joke. Um, you know, I urge you to take this seriously. If you don't do as I say, you'll see me one more time. If you do, no way. What I can't. I get mixed up. If you don't, if you don't do as I say, you'll see me one more time. If you do this correctly, you'll see me two more times. Or, you know, maybe I'm getting it backwards. But I was just like, oh my god, this guy's so. You know, what's he talking about? I was right. Like, really what's afraid. going on here? What, what, what's it's like? The whole, the whole scene is interesting. And then, you know, when you look back at the movie and you kind of like analyze it, hey, you're like, okay. The whole entire weird parking lot and the like the diner scene that's supposed to be the real world and there's that crazy homeless thing behind the 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 dumpster and you're like what you know what's going on here yeah and it's terrifying when you think about it and you think about the implications of the movie from you know the outside perspective um you know i'm actually this is going to lead into kind of you know my next question right so shag duck Ursula, you know, they're, they're both, you know, they're, they're novels about ultimately about demons and uh, the occult and secret unknown ancient languages, ancient texts, dark magic, that type of thing. Do you, do you have a personal interest in that kind of stuff? Where, where's it coming from? Mm. Well, I'm, I'm a skeptic. Uh, I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in ghosts or magic but I like to pretend that those things are real because it's fun. So a lot of the stuff, I, you know, fantasy stuff I read, you know, has, you know, magic in it and time travel and whatnot. It takes you away from, well, it takes you away from here and now on the mundane and it takes you to someplace, um, someplace uh, fascinating, uh, fantastic. It's the whole point of, of the genre, I guess. Um, but I, I have, you know, studied the occult, um, but not not as a practitioner, but to be entertained. Um, when when it's done convincingly, then my mind, my imagination, runs with it. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Now you said that you went to school in Austin, right? Yeah. Okay. Don't they have one of the Alistair Crowley's tarot decks in Austin, I think. Are you familiar with that? Oh, they probably do. Um, a friend of mine would know for sure. Uh, we both worked at the um, uh, Humanities Research Center where they probably have, have that sort of thing. Um, but uh, again, uh, uh, Stephen's a librarian because I'm a librarian and I knew that if I put him in that setting i could write about it convincingly with with little effort because you know i know what goes on in the library right it makes me want to be a librarian actually i like also well the um the idea that there's this vast these vast uh, warehouses of 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 material and and some of it could be um um dangerous appeals to me because i, I work in a library and um, you know, what if, and what if there's a occult tome that opens portals to, to hell or wherever? Um, you know, when, when I was reading Shag Dick the first time, um, I really was reminded of one of my favorite novels and which is Umberto Eco's Foucault's Pendulum. And uh -huh. I mean, it's a completely different plot, but the vibe is somewhat the same. It's got this, you know, it's got a bunch of academic guys investigating weird stuff, obsessing about tomes in musty libraries. Uh, you know, they kind of have like this, they're kind of like geeks, but at the same time, they have this like dangerous edge to them because they're involved in some like local political stuff. Um, what made you write a novel 
that kind of like had these complex esoteric kind of occult elements. I mean, there's a lot of like mystery underneath the surface of Shag Dick that I really liked. So what made you choose this mode of fiction to write? Mm -hmm. Well, it could be because um, as Stephen himself says in the, on page one, I'm just a regular guy. What am I going to write about? How am I going to fill up this diary? Um, my life is so boring. So I wanted to, um, you know, by having um, him be exposed to occult elements, um, the way he uh, explores it is, is the way that a, a regular person would explore it. Uh, so the discovery is slow. Um, he was slow to understand, uh, slow to believe. It's all a matter. It, it all has to do with um, writing something authentic, right? Because not every day do you get a weird, you know, three fingered handprint on the hood of your car, right? Yeah, um, I, I, I recall, um, you know, books and movies that do that badly. The characters accept what's happening way too easily, and you go, "Nah, he wouldn't act like that," you know. Um, just Steven into that world slowly to acclimate him to it. Yeah. Now about Steven real fast. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of the book is uh, his uh, hedgehog and foxes thing. So, okay. So for, for people that have not read the, the novel um, somewhere in the beginning of the novel, Steven's in the library and he's kind of like listing all the different employees and co you know, his coworkers and he is labeling them either a fox or a hedgehog. Uh -huh. And it's basically, you know, the way I read it was like, you know, the foxes were the smart, kind of intuitive, interesting ones. And the hedgehogs were kind of like the NPCs, right? To use modern uh, internet <laughs> lingo. Um, and I love that. I've been calling people foxes and hedgehogs in my mind for the last two years, ever since I read it. Where'd you get that from? Where'd that come from? I love that. Well, I'm not. 100% sure Stephen knows what he himself means by foxes and hedgehogs, but I stole the idea from Isaiah Berlin, Berlin through Woody Allen. Um, I forget the Woody Allen movie. There's a, a character um, who's talking to her, um, her um, therapist about classifying people as foxes and hedgehogs. And she clearly knows what she's talking about, but you know, I didn't, I don't think the viewer does, but that's not the point. Um, I just wanted to express an aspect of Steven's personality um, to make him feel like more of a real person. Um, I, I'm the kind of person I love lists. I make lists of things. Um, I used to make lists of things that I hated. Like I had a list of <laughs> just things I hate um, sounds that I hated and, and I would, uh, you know, maintain it and update it and look at it and think about it. And at some point I thought, you know what, I don't care about, I don't want to dwell on things that I hate. I just want to focus on things that I love. Um, cause it, you know, it puts you in a, in a headspace that's not fun to be in when you're dwelling on something you hate. Right. Um, so yeah, categorizing and it all ties into being a librarian. That's what we do is we categorize books um, and group them together. You know, like like subjects go together. It's something that I think everybody does. We we label things. Um, it it's not. Um, I mean, yeah, that's where I got I got the foxes and hedgehogs from. But it's it's not really that meaningful. Um, I could have made it more meaningful. There's, you know, there's things I could have um, um, developed. Um, I developed you, it a little bit in the book. You know, it, it worked, right? Because you have the stone fox, right? Which is the ultimate fox. And, you know, mm. that it felt really real because, you know, when I was growing up and, you know, even in my 20s and 30s in our friends group, uh, we used to always kind of invent titles for people. Like, we're like, oh, you know, we'd name somebody... Uh, like wallet. There was this girl we used to call wallet because my brother used to always bum money off of her. So, and she always gave him money. So she called her, you know, the wallet uh -huh. to this day. I remember wallet. I remember what she looks like. I cannot remember her real name because you know, she was just wallet. Um, so we used to do that kind of labeling and that kind of stuff too. So it felt like a real realistic thing. 
All right, but you know, we are here actually because a big monumental event is going to happen soon, which is you're going to release the sequel to Shagda called Ursula of Ulm. I actually have it right here on my desk. And uh, but tell me about it. Tell, tell the listeners about the sequel to Shagduk. Well, when I began writing Shagduk, um, I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And I, and I knew where I was going. I had a, an outline. And I knew that certain things had to happen along the way. But there had to be some space between them. They couldn't, it, the whole thing couldn't unravel in one week. It had to be a gradual process. Like like the first mystery you come up with is um, what happened to Sherwood. Um, you know, they don't, they don't even know that there's anything of an occult nature um, going on until later. So I, de- I try to develop the story naturally over time, but Stephen writes in his diary every day. So there's a, you know, a page a day. The thing ballooned into 300,000 words. And um, when it came time to publish, uh, you know, we're looking at a pretty thick book. (laughs) So the publisher said, well, this is, it's too long. Um, So we looked for a kind of a a naturally occurring break that felt right. Um, And it didn't feel like an ending, but it had to feel like the end of a, of a, of a part so I had to rework the ending a little bit to end the book the way that it ends. But Ursula of Ulm is simply begins the next day. I think Shagbeck ends on March 8th or May, you know, May 8th or something like that. So, so Ursula begins on um, May 9th. So it's just a continuation of the story. It's not um, a sequel per se. Think think of like Lord of the Rings. Um, Tolkien conceived of it as one book, but the publisher broke it into three different ones. Right. And you know, yeah. you're right. I'm looking at it right now. Monday, May 9th, 1977 is the first entry in Ursula. Yeah. And, you know. Just the next day. Just the next day, right? And to take us to our last topic, the quote you have here is, who is the fox? I am the fox. Who are you? I am me. So more fox references okay so so somebody who's well versed in literature and his studies you know metaphor and tropes and um highfalutin academic approach to to writing i have a little bit of that but i'm not really you know i never thought of myself as a writer so i'm aware of these things as i, I read good books but I, I, I'm intuitive enough that I recognized that if you introduce something on the page, you can develop it, and there's strength in that. So, um, and and ultimately, um, you can, you know, metaphors develop naturally. Right. Um, if there, you know, there are metaphors in my book and things that have a deeper meaning, but. Um, I didn't plan them. They uh, just naturally occurred. So right, right from the beginning, you've got the stone fox and you've got his foxes and hedgehogs. And so naturally you're thinking, well, is the stone fox, is she a fox in multiple senses? And, you know, Stephen talk, thinks about that and talks about it. But so anytime that a fox appears, naturally your mind wants to connect the dots. You know, is this meaningful um, what does it mean? Is it important to the story? Um, and it, it can be, um, ultimately, but I, I don't, I don't go into really advance necessarily. And yeah, a, a lot of this stuff is sort of a red herring because, you know, I started to develop it, but then it, I couldn't continue with that development in a natural way. It would feel forced. And if you force it, then that breaks the spell and you're not in the story anymore. You're, you're outside of it. A horrible example of, you know, way too many references and too much stuff is, uh, um, what's that real shitty novel they made into a shitty movie? Ready player one. And hmm. yeah, I, I didn't see that, but I, I, I know of it. I've never, I've never, I didn't see it either, but I, I tried reading it and I quit because it was just garbage, but it was all about just vomiting 
1980s video game references over and over and over, and it was so just so uh-huh. try hard, and it didn't feel authentic at all, it didn't feel organic. But you know, your writing does does feel organic, and you know, Shagdick itself and Ursula is very, I mean, to use a, a literary term right now, it's a very maximalist novel, in my opinion. Um, it's very along. I would put it on the shelf next to like Thomas Pinchon because it is maximalist in its detail as in it focuses. It, it's not, it's not like Hemingway where it's just very minimalist and you know, the story and the thread are the front and center. You've, you've got tons of stuff just kind of floating around and the reader has to really work at pulling out the plot, pulling out the thread through the middle of the narrative um, otherwise, you know, you're, you're swimming in like, you know, today's meeting agenda, you know, like microphone reader update, new electric typewriters, new telex machine, ACLA conference yeah. report. And I love that stuff. I, I myself find maximalist writing with just tons of detail to be the ideal form that I enjoy reading and writing. So that's maybe why I am such a big fan of Shagduck, while some other people that tend to be more minimalist, more to the point, don't like it. But you know what they say is like if you don't, you know, if there's people that like like it and don't don't like it, that's that's how you know you succeeded because if you're pleasing everybody, it's yeah. garbage, you know. Yeah, um, I, I'm not trying to please anybody except myself, and and sometimes I do write specifically for for people I know who I think uh, I'll write something and think oh so and so is going to laugh when they read that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, since. Uh, let me ask you, do, what do you think of uh, Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses? Uh, that So I've never read Ulysses, okay? That's one of my to-do lists, all right? I've read The Dubliners, but I've never read Ulysses. So well, I, I wonder if that's an example of your, your what do you call it, maximalism? Yeah, it, it is. It, it is. And uh, a, lo- a lot of, like I said, like, you know, Thomas Pynchon's V is a great example. All, you know, all his work. One of the novels that I don't know if you've read, but Shagdick reminds me of a lot is Thomas Pynchon's Inherit Vice and there's a movie too that has kind of very similar vibes. Are you familiar with that work? Yes. Um, I'm also distracted uh, it, in the background. My brain's working in the background to formulate a, a response to something you said a minute ago about that. Um, about um, a, a work being um, peppered with too many references in your Ready Player One. Um, I, I am aware of that pitfall. I, I didn't want to, to make references for their own sake. Um, you know, the way we discussed earlier where there's just too much. So, for example, if Steven goes to drink some coffee, I think, well, what brand of coffee would he have drunk? And I try and, you know, make that true and it could be a brand that still exists today though there's a temptation to to make it a, a, a defunct brand that right. only existed in the 70s so you can say hey this is set in the 70s get it um there that that um temptation is always there and sometimes i succumb to it and i and i, I put it in there but um every single reference can't be you know locked into 1977 um a lot of it has to still exist today, and a lot of it um, preceded the seventies. You know, he drives a Nash, you know, a, a sixty-two Nash um, instead of a seventy-seven car. Right. But I yeah, mean, I am worried that I have I'll have too much of that stuff in there, so I do try and keep an eye on that. Uh, that makes that makes perfect sense. So Ursula continues exactly where Shagdick ends, and there's a third third part. Um, just like Shagdick, Ursula ends, and the next part, will the next part start off exactly like Ursula a day after the end of it? More or less, yes, and the third part is is already basically written. Um, okay. Book two turned out to, again, turned out to be too long, and so we had to say, well, where, where can we end this so, um, you know, the publisher doesn't go broke? Um, just just yeah. And it, it posed a problem uh, because I wanted, again, I wanted it to have a, a, a satisfactory ending that wasn't really an ending. 
um, had to leave you wanting more. And then, then I had a new problem. It's like, well, how do I make the third book begun? Um, Cause if you just arbitrarily break it somewhere in the middle, um, you can't people leave people hanging like that. So it, it, it posed some new problems. Um, but um, I worked on it and I think it, I think the reader will it, like what I did. So I, I do, and I do, for example, and I am a hardcore hater of series and sequels and any of that kind of thing. But Shagduk, if you just read Shagduk, you're good. You know what I mean? Like, if you never get around to going past it, it's perfectly fine. And it feels like a complete novel to me. And the same, you know, going yeah, on. Yeah, so. It feels the same. And I... it feels more like a episodic television show um, like a season of like Twin Peaks than an actual like series to me you know and I like that because it, you know you don't have to read the second book you're gonna want to read the second book because by the time I finished Shag Dick, I was like man I want I want more I actually think I, I sent you a, a text message I was like hey man can, can, did you, is it done can you send it to me and you're like oh, I'm writing it right now but um, yeah, that's you know that's wonderful. But there are some people that do get scared away by series. So for the people listening here, do not okay read Shagduck, and then you're gonna like it, and then you're gonna definitely want to read Ursula because you want to spend more time with these characters. Yeah, it's not. It's definitely not a series. It's the same thing as Lord of the Rings. It's 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 one book in three volumes. And it's done. It's not like George R. R. Martin where we're going to wait 15 years for the next one to come out. Not that I read it. Right. I read the first few, but I gave up a long time ago. Um, so you, you have you have the whole, you know, the whole series done. When the next one comes out, which I'm going to expect another year or two, what next? You got anything else after that? Any other novels planned? Well, there, there could be a fourth and, and again, this is not a series. It would just be um, an opportunity to tell the rest of the story. But I think by that time, um, I might want to try something different. And, and I do have lots of lots of ideas. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to all of them. I've read some of your short stories too, which, interestingly enough, you the Ursula starts off with one of your short stories I've previously read, and it's probably one of the best short stories out of that uh that set that pylon put out the um the one about the executioner the dare schlem well a word about that um i had the opportunity to contribute to the anthology and i thought well i don't want to distract myself from my novel so maybe I could write something that ties into it somehow. And um, yeah. so I started thinking about um, other characters and their background story. And um, so it was an opportunity to, to enrich what I was already working on. Right. And it, and it fits perfectly. The whole, the whole, the whole theme and the whole, you know, you're, it's like some shag deck, but back in the early modern era, um, so, you know, now we're, I want to talk about publishing real quick, right? So you went with Pylon Press, which, you know, we're all mutual friends there, and we know most of the people, like uh, Sky Hernstrom and those guys. Um, why did you choose to go with a small, like, independent publisher, one that's brand new? You're actually their first novel, Um instead of like trying to do the traditional, get an agent, do the New York thing. Well, when I first started writing, I wanted to, to self publish because um, the, remember I, I spoke earlier of the, the joy I got from creating a zine. Right. Um, it was, I was going to create the cover. I had these ideas. Um, I was going to learn how a book was made from its inception to um, its publishing and, and, ended up on the shelf you know as as a librarian and a former bookseller uh, you know there are aspects of uh, of the life of a book that interested me and i wanted to um to learn about all of it and this this would give me an opportunity to be 
kind of become my own publisher and see what what's involved. And I had I had done it before in the nineties. I was the um, uh, I produced a number of um, art reference works and published them myself. So I knew about you know how to obtain an ISBN and I knew how to do basic layout, but there wasn't, um, the creativity ended there with, with a novel. I foresaw the opportunity to design something beautiful, like what, you know, what typefaces would I use? What artwork would I use? Where would I get it from? Um, I wanted to make a beautiful object. So I was looking, I was looking forward to it, but then when I had an opportunity to publish with, um, with Pylum, um, full disclosure, uh, Neil Durando is uh, a dear friend of mine. And so when he showed an interest in publishing it, I saw it as an opportunity for us to do something together and create something together. Um, so that's, that's why I went ahead and, and did, um, did it that way. But no, I had no, no intention of going with a publisher at all at, at the beginning. Right. And, you know, he's a fantastic editor. He's a fantastic editor. I, I remember maybe a year or two years ago, I sent him a short story and he was like, oh, I'll do a quick edit on it. And he sent it back to me. And I was like, oh, damn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, I yeah. sold it the next morning. Like, he did a 10 minute edit on it. I did all his changes and it sold instantly. I was like, okay, this guy is the real deal. He knows what he's talking about and it shows and everything problems put out. Like it's the, the quality of the editorial element of it is so above and beyond almost everything else I've seen. I mean, it's better than a lot of, you know, mainstream New York published stuff, to be honest. I mean, I'll, I'll put up, you know, I'll put up Shagduk um, against almost any book you can grab off the brand new release shelf at Barnes & Noble because it, it's so much better. And I'll stand by that statement. Well, people who self-publish and a lot of indie publishers don't have the knowledge and background that that Neil has. Uh, the book that you read is not the book I, I turned over to Neil. Um, it was... Um, you know, comparatively, uh, really un unpolished, and a lot of the um, the things that that you find are 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 rich in Shagduk. Um, maybe those did not exist when I when I first turned it over to Neil. He t um, taught me and continues to teach me how to how to to polish something in into a, a pearl. Um, there are tricks and tips and tools and techniques, you know, things that some of some of which I know intuitively, but I don't um, know how to uh, to bring them out, to bring them to the forefront, right? Yeah, and then other things that I, d I didn't know at all, um, and then he he sees the potential that I don't see because when you when you critique your own work and you pour over your own work you see certain things, but when you give it to someone else, they see different things. Well, he has a trained eye and a trained mind. So he could read it and say, well, you should develop this. You should develop this. Um, this isn't working. Um, so his added perspective um, was, was very important. Right. And, you know, in the independent scene, and I've, I think I, I talked with this in a previous episode where we were talking about uh, independent writing and the independent kind of self-publishing fiction. Um, we lack, if that space lacks anything, it's good editors. And what we don't, yeah. we don't realize is that some of the greatest novels ever written, some of the greatest work of art are really a collaboration between the author and the editor. And, you know, yes. Like, Right. To take it back to how we talked about music, it goes the same thing for music. You know, the band is like the author, you know, the musicians are like the author, but a lot of the greatest records were really the product of, and the hand, direct hand of the producer and the sound engineer, you know, the, uh, the oh, guy, absolutely. right. The guy behind the headphones in, you know, behind the glass, that's telling everybody, you should bring some of this up. And how about we do this volume this way? And sometimes 
that editorial skills that themselves are, you know, an artistic endeavor that is vastly different than the actual writing element of it. Um, and we don't have editors in the independent, you know, field because it the the way it's set up doesn't really it doesn't really like uh, suit it. You know, like what's an independent editor going to do, right? So small small presses like Pylum are the ideal like like uh, vehicles, in my opinion, to where you can mix a you know superstar editor with a budding you know potential writer. And when those two people meet together. You can have magic and you can have the freaking Beatles, right? Uh, but I mean, look, you know, I'm a music guy myself and you, you look back and so much of like the sound or the, you know, groundbreaking like albums like uh, Joy Division, for example, was all created in the studio by the engineers and they had just as much uh, important work and important input than the actual musicians themselves who brought the spark, the, you know, the, the meat of the, of the album and the music. And uh, that's, what's wonderful about Pilot and Neil is that the guy knows what he's talking about and you can see it in this product. You can see it in the results and, you know, you can see it in Shag Dick, you can see it in Ursula, you can see it in this, in the short compilation of short stories. And you can see it in his edits that he did for Sky Herrenstrom's stuff. And I know he has a novel coming out, so I cannot wait to see what those guys do with, you know, a full sky novel. Um, and I look forward to, you know, reading more stuff from Pilot. I, I think every listener I have that's into the idea of independent small publishing fiction is to go to their website, go to pilotpress.com and order Shagdick or another one of the uh, collections that they have and see what great independent editing is about because that's where it's at. Well, I'm really looking forward to Sky's novel too. Um, but how you steered the conversation back to music, I'm, I'm glad you, you did that because it recalls an earlier question where you wondered, um, does music influence me? I'm constantly drawing parallels between um, not just music and writing, but all of the arts, wondering what do they have in common? Um, and is there you know, such thing as, um, well, I, I won't even go there. I can't go there. Um, when you talk about um, what an editor brings to um, a writer's output uh, and, and drew the parallel to uh, the producer, um, I might also uh, mention engineers and the, um, the studio in which something's recorded. There's so many different elements that go into um, the sound of an album that people aren't necessarily aware of. And I think that like good editors, good producers, um, it's a lost art. Um, and I think back to the, um, there was actually a time when producers were famous people, famous for what they did and sound engineers. And you don't hear a lot of talk about that anymore. Like, can you name a great living editor? For example, I don't think a lot of people could. Um, I don't think a lot of people could name a great living music producer. Uh, Rick Rubin uh, is the only one I can think of right now. Well, yeah, he's, he's technically alive. Um, <laughs> right. I can't remember what he did after Johnny Cash, but um, – I hate, yeah, I, hate, I hate his style, by the way. Example. Just to add a, a note, I, I dislike his. I think he sat, oversaturates the music, and it, 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 the editing on the albums he puts out are. I'm not a fan of it at all. Like he ruined the Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, Californication album, because they're all like tuned for radio play. They're too loud. They're not. They, there's no nuance to the sound. So I'm not a huge fan of him, to be honest. Um, yeah, some of that stuff is um, beyond his control even. Uh, and we, we'd be getting into the realm of technology and um, trends in uh, recorded music. Um, to, to touch upon them briefly, um, you may be aware of the loudness wars right. where music has been pumped up and... Um, uh, compressed 
so it could sound uh, optimally for um, earbuds because earbuds were all the rage in you know around the turn of the century um, and that came at the expense of how music sounded on a home hi-fi system or in your car um, now people stream music and they listen to it on their computer speakers or something um, and so perhaps um, the people who produce music are optimizing it for that you know it's even made on computers now right uh, I mean, but, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Because you know, I listen to Spotify. I have a Spotify account. I have a you know a, a pr- premium Spotify account, and as much as I hate it, I that's the majority of my music is streamed when I'm driving, and there's definitely a, a loss of quality. Like, it, it's interesting how we consume music in a much lower quality than during the CD era, and it's 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 wild when you think about it because. I remember that I used to care about, oh, you know, my car speakers sound awesome, but now I don't because it's all going to sound like shit because it's all streamed on Spotify. So, you know, there's no real point in having super expensive speakers. My car doesn't even, my brand new car does not even have a CD player in it. Like, so my only option is to stream. So that's definitely a, a factor. The technology, how we consume things is definitely a factor in, you know, the medium itself. Well, I've heard about how some streaming um, services they brag about the fidelity. Well, it's like look at the look at the source material that they're being faithful to. It sounds terrible to begin with. If something sounds ter- terrible to begin with, it doesn't matter how faithful you reproduce it. It's still going to sound terrible. You have to go back to the days when music sounded um, incredible to begin with, and I'm thinking of in the fifties. There was uh, RCA had a series called Living Stereo, and the engineers and producers involved in creating these records, um, they wanted they designed these records to sound as good as possible on your brand new hi-fi, which people were just being able to afford. So you could go home and put this record on and listen to it, and it would sound amazing in your living room. And so these people really knew what they were doing, but then they got older, they retired, um, technology changed. And, you know, ag- again, people started listening to music on a Walkman or on earbuds or on their computers, streaming Bluetooth. Um, and they took away that knowledge. Um, it died with them. And you see that not just in music, but in, in all of the arts, and not maybe not even just the arts, but in the whole world, everything. Um, I, I see traces of um, people don't know how to do something fundamental anymore. Right. And you look at it, and you're, sh- and it's shocking if if you're an older person and you remember how something was done well, um, and it's not anymore, and nobody seems to care or notice because how how would they notice young young people who weren't exposed to living stereo? records for example they don't know how good music can sound when it's done properly right and that's and that's a really sad thing when you think about it and you're right i i mean i'm not as old as you are i was born maybe a decade after you or two decades i'm not sure but i i mean i see it i see that that a lot of the things out there just are just shoddy low quality you know things that um you know from everything from instruments to cars to you know the houses we live in are just just crappy (laughs) you know like they're falling apart and uh it's sad and you're right it's not just music uh film like movies for example have the same problem music does right now because in the same way we you know we spotify everything we listen to you know movies are now made for netflix and for streaming on you know amazon prime and the quality of the movies the, the visual element of the movies is j- just nowhere near what it used to be in you know the dvd era of me growing up or even the you know the the high definition you know uh, movie theater film that we used to like see when we were growing up um everything right now looks like a made for tv movie i don't know if you ever noticed that yeah, um, things are re- are filmed digitally. Uh, I, I first noticed when they switched over to videotape. 
Um, and I, I understood when that happened, what, what things that were filmed on film, um, we, we took that for granted until it went away. Um, and now you have things that are recorded in um, high resolution and they have high res TVs. It, it has the, you know, I find myself walk, you know, I have um, relatives with a high res TV and they watch stuff in high res and I walk up to the screen and I'm looking for the pixels and you can't even really see them because it's the resolution is so great, but, mm. but then they watch an old movie and you know, again, your source material is, you, you can't improve it. So an old movie is still going to look like an old movie. So I don't care about high res stuff because I don't watch, um, you know, high res things. Yeah. And it's not even just the format itself. It's the, the medium that people consume things through. I, I work with a lot of younger people and I, I say this a lot on it on, on here, but, um, a lot of people watch movies on their laptops or on their phones, which to me is insane. I, I don't know how anybody could watch a movie on their cell phone. I get no enjoyment out of it. I have never been one of those guys that can watch a movie on a plane. I was just like no interest whatsoever. Um, but yeah, but a lot of people watch Netflix. They'll stream their Netflix or their HBO on their freaking cell phone. And they'll read their books on their cell phone or on their directly on your laptop and to me that's like wow i can never imagine doing that you know it's like and as creators of you know fiction or you know any type of art we we do have to kind of take that into account that that is the reality we live in today yeah um it's great if you can enjoy a movie on your phone like i'm, I'm jealous um, <laughs> right, me too but when uh would nobody uh if that's fine for the majority of people then the people who create this stuff to begin with um it's it's becomes less important to them um to make it um um yeah, just, for the, a certain point, yeah. the quality of certain aspects of it right. like if you if you read all your books on your phone then what do you care about a beautiful dust jacket right Right. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a Kindle reader. I will, you know, admit right now, I enjoy reading in a Kindle. And I've gotten to the point where I have a hard time reading um, actual you know, paper books. I love them. I still collect them. I buy every single book that I love that I read on Kindle. I usually buy it in hardcover if I can find it. Um, but just for the ease of use, the Kindle is just great. I've got a five-year-old <laughs> kid that I have to put to bed and turning lights on in my house after she's asleep is kind of difficult. So I just I can read in bed without waking up my wife or any of that. So there's a lot of like good elements about the Kindle. Um, I also, I travel a lot and I'm not taking, you know, 20 books to Papua New Guinea with me. I'm taking, uh, you know, a hundred Kindle files on my Kindle and I can read them, you know, the entire time I'm there or on the plane. So there's, there's good things about the future and there's, you know, unfortunate things like the loss of things now you're a music guy i've noticed that you know there's a huge resurgence of vinyl right now like you know, barnes and noble sells has a vinyl section doesn't even have a cd section anymore but there's a vinyl section uh, is that happening in your part of the country well it is and what's funny is when vinyl came back um all the equipment that you could make records on had been disassembled and put in storage and there was like one guy who knew how to operate it and so at first all these indie bands wanted to put out a record on on vinyl and they had there was this huge waiting list because there was like one machine that could make records so they had to like rediscover this completely lost art right and um since all the people who were masters of it had retired or passed away the first vinyl, uh, the first records of the um, um, their reappearance, the quality was terrible. Like the like the hole wouldn't even be in the middle. The labels would be off center. Um, the records would skip. They were warped. 
Um, all, all the things they had refined before that, that knowledge disappeared. Right. I actually bought a record and it was of a n- new musician and it was warped. And I was like, oh man. So I ended up taking it back and they, they were cool and they gave me another <laughs> copy of the record store. But yeah, I, I actually read about that and that that's fantastic. But to me, even here, so I'm, I'm in South Carolina in the South, right? And wow. there's tons of record stores around here go to savannah georgia and there's tons of record stores and you know back when i was still in california i feel like there was just record stores everywhere and i thought it was awesome they're expensive though pricey well it depends on what you're buying right. um a brand new uh adele record could set you back 30 bucks right. but yesterday i went to this old record store that's been there the whole time it never went away it's still there i go in and i bought a giant pile of country records from like the 70s and 80s and some of them were still shrink wrapped and the guy laughed and he said look at this price sticker it's it says 1985 on it we nor stores would normally send back merchandise that didn't sell to this the distributor but um, we just kept it and this stuff has been sitting under there for 40 years and i walk in there and get a whole big pile of brand new records still in shrink wrap um for like three bucks each and it's like what is going on here why did, does no one care about this music and it all it's beautifully recorded it's back when people knew how to produce an album so by the time that stuff hits my turntable, I know that the sound that comes out, it's going to be optimal. Right. That's awesome. I, yeah, you know, it's going to be I'm, great. I'm always looking for those kind of finds. Just recently, actually, um, maybe a year and a half ago, my wife went to visit her family and she took a crate and it's one of those um, licorice pizza record store crates. I don't know if you're familiar with those. That's like another oh, yeah. 70s thing. And it was a bunch of vinyl that her mom and dad bought when they were young. And uh, it was awesome. There's some some gems in there that are probably worth money. And, you know, first first printing type stuff of some fantastic stuff from the 70s. And uh, we lugged that across the United States. And it's one of our prized possessions. Um, but, man, we went, on a, we went on a music tangent here. But that's the whole point of having a good conversation, right? Well, yeah, um, music does inspire me, as you asked earlier. Um, when one way that it inspires me is, you know how we talk about um, you don't want to introduce anachronistic detail into a, a period piece. Well, how do you make people talk if you didn't live during that time or you don't remember? So I, I, I took great pains to have my characters say things the way they would have been said in the seventies. And not only does that include the vocabulary and their phrasing, but the kinds of things they say, Uh, and that's really hard to do. So I would watch um, interviews from, from night from the seventies. But if you listen to music from a, from that time period, that's a, that gives you a good clue as to what people were thinking and what they were talking about and, and how they said it. So when I'm listening to um, like a country album, they have a really colorful way of talking country people. And it, it, and it sounded like my relatives in Fort Worth, the way they talked. And so I'll jot down these little phrases that they say just, you know, turns of phrase that, you know, words that just felt like, uh, this feels like 1974 to me. And I'll try and I look for opportunities to use them. That's such a great, that's such a great way to do it actually. And, you know, I, it never dawned, it dawned on me to like go back and listen to music and watch interviews from that era. Um, that that's, that's actually genius. I mean, I well, have a you- quick story. Um, Stephen goes to a um, library conference and I thought of the library conferences I've been to. What One of the things that happens is you come home with a bunch of swag. So I thought, what kind of swag do they get in 1977 at a library conference? And uh, I thought of a coffee mug that said librarians do it better. And I chuckled and I wrote it down. I'm, oh, I'm going to use that. That's funny. 
But then I thought, well, did people say blank do it better in 77? When did that phrase become a phrase? So it's really hard to do research for stuff like that. So what I do is I try and find examples of the phrase being said prior to 1977. So I'm Googling and I'm searching. I end up searching on eBay and I typed in quotation marks, do it better and just hit enter. And a t-shirt came up and it said, nurses do it better 1977. So I'm like, well, what's this? So I, I, I look at the listing and I'm like, how does the seller know this shirt is from 77? Because t-shirts don't really have the year they're made. Right. How would she know that? So she had a story and it said in 1977, Led Zeppelin was on tour and Robert Plant was on stage shirtless and someone from the audience threw a t-shirt up on stage and he put it on and it said nurses do it better and he spoke into the microphone and said something like oh I can vouch for that my wife is a nurse or you know something like that so the seller of this t-shirt dated it for me so I, I had proof that in 77 nurses do it better librarians do it better was a thing people were saying that's fucking awesome man <laughs> that's a yeah, great, story, that's great. Man. um so that tv show i mentioned earlier paul morel um they said something um oh that guy's toast and i thought people didn't say your toast in 69 when did that phrase begun and so i did a little bit of googling and and i think bill murray was the first person to say your toast in the mid 80s right um so they would not have said that in 69 okay. so if you do a little homework you can you know get that world building going yeah like you're you're basically like the pop culture music version of like one of those like world war ii aficionados yeah yeah <laughs> that criticizes okay. you're like actually the ss uniform had two buttons in the front not one you know but that that's that's the fun part of it right that's the authenticity of it it's and that's fun but i just want to get it right and um I want to capture something that that that's true. Right, that's such a great story. And if all that stuff is, if if it all rings true, then the the stuff that I feed you about the occult and demons and whatever else I cook up, um, the greater the chance that that's going to be true to you also. That's that's true, and that's the fantastic point. And that, that's exactly what if you know if you're a writer listening to this, pay attention. Okay, you make everything seem real then your crazy shit's going to seem even realer than the actual stuff. Cause you know, sometimes, yeah. sometimes truth is weirder than fiction, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, JB, I got one more question for you. This is the official last question. Okay? okay. So this is the end of the show question. What, what are you listening to? What are you watching? What are you reading that you would recommend to the people listening? Like, give me a book or a movie or a TV show or something that you think is great. And you know, it captures what you're into and you think that people listening should go give it a read or give it a, a, a listen to. Well, when it comes to fantasy, uh, you can't do much better than Jack Vance and his dying earth series. Um, I'm to the point where anything I read has to inform what I'm writing because I don't have time for that kind of um, luxury. So um, I'm about to read some Graham Greene because his, the excellence of his writing, I hope that rubs off on me. Right. Me too. Just because of the conversations offline. We had. <laughs> when I read something that's not polished or it's not, you know, it's not um, well-written, then that, that rubs off on you too. You, 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 you can't help it sometimes. Um, naturally the stuff I listen to, I, I don't listen to anything after 1980, basically. I mean, there are exceptions of course, but all day long I'm listening to classical music and an old country and classic rock. Uh, the same, the same stuff Steven listens to exactly the same stuff Steven listens to. And when I get ideas about it, I think to myself, is this an idea that Steven could get? Is this something he might put in his diary? Um, do you like any new music, like anything in contemporary? 
Well, I have heard mu- newer music that I like, but sometimes I don't like the way it's recorded. It's not, it doesn't sound right to me. It's not warm. Um, it sounds, it's too loud. I, I don't know. Um, there's, I can't think of a single thing that I care about that was recorded yesterday. Um, and if I do, I can live without it. It's just not. And, and part of that is because the, the stuff that I do listen to is stuff I've been listening to my whole life. So it has meaning to me. Um, you know how you listen to a song and it, and it reminds you of um, a day in, in your old house or your old street. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, flavors and smells come back to mind. Um, I, I, I cherish that t- those types of connections and I don't have, I'm not connected to the music that they're making today and what they're writing today. Right. I think I was listening to the Brett Easton Ellis podcast and he, he has a wonderful podcast and he, you know, he talks a lot about music and, and culture. And I think he's, he's in, just turned 60. So he listens to a lot of music that, you know, Steven would have been listening to cause he's probably the same age Steven the character is. Um, and he said something, or one of his guests said something along the lines of that your taste in music becomes very like locked into your like formative years of your life. So usually your teenage years is when you kind of like lock in your music taste and you tend to stick to stuff that kind of sounds like that for the rest of your life. And uh, yeah, I've my- read that before. Um, my, I'm completely locked into 1977 to 81 right everything about those four years is is perfect to me i i'm i'm kind of the same way like i the music i listened to at the end of my high school era is what i still listen to but it's not the 90s stuff though i listened to stuff that was older than the stuff that was on the radio when i was you know when i was of age right um, so I'm, I'm stuck listening to like Nick Haven, the bad seeds, but I, I, I do like a lot of new stuff. I like, I love Lana Del Rey. I'm a Lana Del Rey, you know, fan here. Um, well, that's great. Um, that, that, that will help you be more connected to the times in which we live in a positive way. Um, for good and, and frail. <laughs> and for, for good. And you'll be less miserable because you. You're able to enjoy that. I, I, I envy that. I wish it were true. easier for me. But when I read when I read a book on vacation, I take ten real books with me. My my suitcase is loaded down with 1960s era James Bond paperbacks that are going <laughs> to fall apart after I read them once. But I'm stubborn that way. I can't read an ebook. I can't read um, a new printing of something. Just a just a cantankerous hater. All right, well, JB. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not about hate at all. It's all about love. It's the smell of the paper, the decaying paper, and the feel of it, and the the typography. That, you and, know what? That's true. You know, you you are a book hipster, right? I I guess so. Um, but, but you do. You're a librarian. You live books. You know, you're an author. I mean that that is that is your world. And I can see, I can see that, you know, I can see that in the way you write and the way you talk about writing and music. And that's fantastic. And I wish more of us were like that and took and really just loved the art around us instead of, you know, considering it so, so disposable and such a consumer product as opposed to actual artifacts of culture and art. Yeah, yeah, perhaps that's something that's missing in today's world is uh, the love that goes into things. Um, just for one more random example. Remember when televisions were beautiful? They were a big, beautiful piece of carved wood with green velvet inlays, and you'd open a panel and there'd be like compartments and um, and your record player would be in there and, and drinks, um, you know, like a bar. Um, and now it's a, a piece of black plastic. We all have these pieces of black plastic stuck on our wall and they're hideous and no one seems to care. Right. With like wires hanging out. Now I don't remember when TVs were like that because I grew up in a communist country where we didn't have televisions. So until the nineties when the CRT big CRT ones, uh, yeah. 
came yeah. out. So right now, the big, you know, Samsung giant screen on my wall is actually an improvement over the ugly CRT monstrosity that I had in the 90s. But I have seen the, you know, the f- fantastic, like, I Love Lucy era, like, cabinet televisions and that. I wish they, we went back to something like that. Well, yeah, there was a time when someone's job was to design a TV that looked beautiful in your living room. Right. And then at some point that job went away and now TVs are not beautiful. They're ugly. They're just minimalist and and just black and ugly. All right, JB, it was a pleasure having you on. Thank you for giving me your time. And I hope, I hope to have you back. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to definitely do a full review of Ursula you know, Ursula of Ulm. And I really encourage all the listeners to go to pilotpress.com or on Amazon and purchase Shagduck and Ursula when it comes out, which I actually forgot to ask you, when does it come out? Probably by the summer, I would guess. Uh, There's a lot, a lot that goes into producing a book the right way. Um, I've got a world-class copy editor looking at it right now. Right. Um, that's that's a, a, a privilege um, with being you know teamed up with Pylon Press that a lot of indie publishers um, don't have. They don't have access to a, a, a copy editor like like we have. I'm very very fortunate. Right. I've seen some good writing recently. They thought this is great, but damn, they need a copy editor. Right. No, I, I agree, and that that's one of the the downsides of it. But yeah, so when when Ur- Ursula comes out. And I put out an official review post-publication. I want you back on. Okay, man? Okay. I'd love it. All right. It was a wonderful conversation. You know, we talked about music and all the different stuff. I honestly, I have so many more questions to ask you. And I, I could probably go on for another hour or two because you know, we just, we just like, you know, had such a good time talking. But, you know, we've, I think we've been at it for like almost two hours now. And my wife is like, what are you doing? Do the, the dishes or something. All right, JB, have a good night, and thank you once again for coming on.